we're delighted to welcome you to the 14th Geopolitical Festival protected by Detol. Today's session is supported by a radio partner, MyFM. The Taj Mahal, Amita Beg and Tripur Daman Singh in conversation with Sarthak Malhotra. The Taj Mahal rises above the banks of the river like a solitary tear suspended on the cheek of time by Rabindranath Tagore. The Taj Mahal is integral to Agra's identity, history and economy. It's a focal point of the city's profound Mughal legacy, which reflects in every aspect of its folk arts and heritage. It has become emblematic of romantic love and aesthetic beauty. Yet this dreamlike marble mausoleum faces potential damage from environmental pollution as well as cultural hostility by a segment of ultra-nationalists. An absorbing session with Amita Beg, Tripur Daman Singh and Sartak Malhotra on the multifaceted narratives of the Taj Mahal, its vital importance for India's tourism and its abiding place in the human imagination as a symbol of eternal love. Amita Beg is the Executive Director of World Monuments Fund, India. She was a core member of the Taj Mahal Conservative Conservation Collaborative and over 10 years of engagement at the monument resulted in the book Taj Mahal Multiple Narratives, co-authored with Rahul Mehrota. Tripur Daman Singh is a historian of South Asia and currently the British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. He is the author of two acclaimed books, 16 Stormy Days and Imperial Sovereignty and Local Politics. Sartak Malhotra is a PhD scholar at the Department of Social Anthropology, University of Cambridge. His dissertation explores the multiple lives of the Taj Mahal through long-term ethnographic fieldwork with people who work in and live around the Taj. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section on your screens. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting the Taj Mahal, Amita Beg and Tripur Daman Singh in conversation with Sartak Malhotra. Enjoy the session. Right, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and welcome everybody to this session on the Taj Mahal. I'm Sarthak Malhotra and I've been, I have with me Trevor Daman Singh and Amita Beg in conversation. Uh, hopefully today we're going to try and move beyond the tropes that have confined the Taj Mahal to a monument of love and following in an ethical direction that has motivated a local, local Agra residents to try and go beyond the Taj. So our conversation today will focus a lot about a lot more on the context in which the Taj exists in the city today. And the image that you can see before you, uh, which is uh, an image of the Yamuna Expressway that you see as you drive down from Delhi to Agra, I think is quite emblematic of what we'll talk about today. Not only is there a great deal of ambiguity about this infrastructure project uh, among city residents that it just brings tourists to the Taj Mahal uh, in maybe in three hours and that leads them to not spend enough time in the city, but as well as what you can see before you, a separation between Agra and the Taj, as if these two spaces don't coexist within the same geographical boundaries that we've associated them to uh, exist within. So I guess we could just get on, on it and just start with an understanding of how that complex relationship has actually developed. Amit, I'm going to start with you then. What is the relationship between the Taj Mahal and Agra and how has it come to become so distinct and so separated? Implicit, of course, in this is a very long, complex history of colonial intervention, state formation, as well as the curation of certain expectations around the Taj, which have led to it becoming a monument of love. So as the Taj becomes a monument of love, it becomes less the Rosai Munawwar of Shah Jahan, less the human tomb where Mumtaz Mahal is buried. So can you just take us through some key moments in the transformation and monumentalization of the Rosa into the Taj of today? Thank you. Thank you, Sartek, and thank you, JLF, for this uh, opportunity to talk about the Taj in a much larger context, because one without Agra without the Taj and the Taj without Agra, to me, would cease to exist. I think um, what's happened over time is uh, because of the extraordinary economic collapses, successive collapses in Agra, the complete fissure between the city and the monument, whereas in its conception, it was um, very much designed to be slightly away from the hustle bustle of the city. It was designed as Shah Jahan's sacred site. He was building Jannat. 
he, I mean, it was a stupendous idea where he could appropriate whatever he wanted and even build Jannah. So that, that idea that he, it was uh, scientific, it was technological, cosmological, it's, it represents the cardinal directions for his idea to experiment with um, another world. And every element of the Taj expresses that. But while you've built this great, incredible site, it is also deeply embedded in the city. The very construction of Taj Ganj was designed to create an economic engine that would complement each other. And I think perhaps um, Shah Jahan, having built this, built it with all his um, ideals, got up and left 12 years after he started building, he shifted the capital to Delhi, off went the Umrah, off went his um, chief calligrapher, Makramat Ali, his head foreman, they all, Amanat Ali Khan, they all left and patronage left and inevitably there was a collapse, a collapse of the economy. This was most definitive when the Peacock throne moved and then, you know, everybody knew no one was coming back and of course, Aurangzeb never ruled from Agra, he ruled mostly from the Deccan. Mm -hmm. And then you get the collapse of the Mughal Empire. I mean, it just went through, gradually, gradually collapsed. And there's a sort of hundred years of gray area where Agra is looted, re-looted. Um, bits and pieces are taken off the Taj. It's, it's desecrated. Arrive the British, and you have to give Mr. Curzon his Lord Curzon his due. He decided restored a whole lot of India's monumental heritage, set up structures. But what we lost there was the cultural connection. The very idea of a monument is a colonial construct. The monument, this was Jannath. It had Hafiz saying prayers round the clock. This was the sacred space of the emperors. He had set up a system for this to run in perpetuity. All these systems collapsed over the 100, 150 years before the British took rule, decided the natives couldn't cope with, among, with, with managing such extraordinary heritage and separated us. And that separation has fissured increasingly. And let me be perfectly frank, 75 years into the independence of India, we haven't done anything to re restore that relationship. No, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad we're being frank here. Um, so I guess um, in the process of monumentalization, we've seen the erection of security barriers quite literally and metaphorically. Um, but this has also been a cont historically contingent response. Um, the kind of monument it is today is very different from the kind of monument it was in the 1990s, in the 1960s. So in my own ethnographic work, I, my interlocutors remind me of times when they used to play cricket in Gili Danda inside uh, the Taj. They used to picnic in the gardens, climb up to the domes, uh, uh, go play in the minars, play in the fountains. But all of that is sort of with the gradual increase in tourism, with the gradual increase in security threats, all of that connection has transformed and led to a irrevocable loss. But that loss often is bared by the local community and not so much the lay visitor who visits it. But perhaps let's go back to the foundational problem. Um, in the immediate years following independence, there was a turn towards a kind of modernity that was supposed to turn away from the kinds of colonial cultural programs that had been instituted in this country. So Tripurdaman, if we could just talk a bit about what did it mean for the uh, nation, the early nation state to have in its hand a place like the Taj and what uses was it put to in the immediate problems that the country then faced. And of course, um, Nayanjod Lahiri has written about how there was a great conundrum that the finest Mughal monuments were left in a Hindu majority secular country. So how did Nehru deal with it and what was the relationship between his new monuments, the dams, the hydroelectric projects and these old monuments that were left behind? Um, that's that's a very interesting point. Uh, uh, the sort of a lot of big Mughal monuments were left in India. Equally, there was the feeling that a lot of ancient 
uh, Indian history had been uh, had been left over in Pakistan. I mean, the sites of Harappa and Taxila, for example. Uh, so, um, in in some ways, that's true. But in other ways, uh, the idea of the Taj Mahal as a, as a sort of prized piece of uh, of of Indian heritage is also also profoundly colonial. Uh, it came through colonial rule and. Uh, Many, uh, you know, m- many Indian leaders, Nehru among them, uh, imbibed it from there. Uh, so while there was a kind of supposed to be a turn away from colonial modernity, uh, we didn't see that uh, in the attitude towards built heritage, at least not, uh, not in the early part. For Nehru, one of the important things was that India's Mughal legacy uh, was a crucial component that could be leveraged to uh, to build a kind of composite nationalism, a composite identity that he was uh, that he was looking for, and in this uh, uh, the Taj Mahal was really important. And you see this uh, when he when he talk. There's a famous speech that he gives to the uh, uh, for the centenary, I think, of the Archaeological Survey of India in 1961, where he uh, where he kind of reminds them of the importance that. Uh, that the Taj specifically, but also India's built Mughal legacy has uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of of this sort of attempt to build a composite national culture. And I think for, for that reason, um, the Taj occupies a very uh, special place in the Indian imagination, but also in some ways a very um, politically charged space in the uh, in the Indian imagination as well. Right, of course. And a lot of the things that we do see and um, what I'm going to turn to next is an issue that I think is emblematic again in this photograph. That there is such heavy state presence in the monument. Of course, these are officers of the CISF and they're officers of the ASI. Um, reflecting on the scholarship that has taken place and the practices of the archaeological survey, we tend to see a fixture on conservation practices, on architectural, archaeological, historical analysis that tends to privilege one particular kind of relationship to the past. And that kind of relationship to the past is premised on materiality and it's premised on the notion of dead stone that the, and for my, and I mean, in my experiences in Agra, we see that people have very intimate relationships with the stone. I mean, you can see the Quranic calligraphy, which sacralizes the Taj Mahal. It is paradise, like you said, Amita. So, I mean, would you like to just take us through some of the consequences of this kind of conservation, which while have very important that it's based on modern scientific principles, how much does it touch upon in your experience of working at the Taj Mahal as part of the uh, Taj Mahal Conservatives Collective and your vast experience in Agra? How much do you think there is a balance between the kinds of conservation practices that the ASI does, which, as well as local uh, conservation techniques that we need to adopt to sort of try and move away from an approach to heritage which is not heavily dependent on colonial modernity, but is more uh, post-colonial, decolonial, actually. You know, um, thank you. Thank. I think one of the um, perhaps challenges the ASI faces is while they take care of the stone, etc., very, very well. Um, I don't think they have been able to craft relationships. And unless you're able to build a relationship with the primary custodians and stakeholders, mm-hmm. you will continue to build those divisions. And I'm, this doesn't apply to the Taj, this is across India. That building of a relationship, because whose heritage is it anyway? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. the ESI are mere custodians of our heritage. So unless you are able to dialogue, and I, I don't know that the structure of the ASI as it is has the ability to dialogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the CISF, for instance, moved into the Taj, we made a bit a hue and cry. We said, you know, they've arrived, they've taken over a section of the forecourt and put up a janda. I mean, this is like the siege of the Khyber Fort. I mean, you know, that is not your relationship with the site. I would love to see anybody who is working at the ASI, and the ASI themselves have it. They have a profound respect for what they're doing. 
but these, you know, when we were working there, you would climb up on a cupola to do documentation and you're suddenly confronted by a gun because, you know, maybe the gunman doesn't know what he's protecting or who he's protecting from what. Even that dialogue of immersing the security agencies across the country, and this is a pan-India problem, where is their training to deal with the cultural heritage? All our cultural heritage in India, I could say pre-colonial, mm. has a sacred center embedded in it. Mm -hmm. And we need to deal with that. We need to build that relationship. Um, I think that's the key of it. We need to engage with our, because if you engaged with the residents of Taj Gunj, you wouldn't have this anxiety. This, I mean, Agra doesn't have drinking mm -hmm. water. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Where is the money for that is being sourced from the Taj by the Agra Development Authority? It's being deployed to build higher and higher roads and more and more sandstone pavements and sandstone lights. There is no, no feedback into the city. They had, a, I mean, we've had ADB reports, World Bank reports, JNURM reports, immense number of studies if you are, were able to actually implement one of them and say I will provide sewage sanitation and drinking water this 500 meter buffer zone which we'll talk about mm. only serves to divide the people further and if you don't have drinking water you're really uninterested in whether the fountain at the Taj is working absolutely yeah no definitely and this this antagonism is also uh, okay, Triple Diamond, is this, what does this tell us about the way that the state functions? Um, this, the fact that, I mean, Amita did uh, allude, allude to it a bit, that the, the, the fact that the local population is converted into a native, the natives mm -hmm. were ignorant of their past, although we don't provide this opportunity to understand the kinds of relationships that develop in local communities with built heritage. I mean, our notion of relationship with the past is that the Taj is a tourist site and that's it. We don't tend to develop um, a deeper understanding of the kinds of complex and more sustainable relationships that people have had with their monumental heritage. So, I mean, what do you think it tells us? What about knowledge practices that are concerning history and knowledge practices concerning the management of history uh, in India today? Um, I mean, it's, it's important to remember that uh, while we think of this as often something driven purely by uh, by the executive, by you know the AS, uh, by the ASIO, by the security agencies, etc., a lot of this process has also been driven by the courts. There has been a lot of litigation, uh, and a lot of this is, for example, driven by the sort of famous Supreme Court judgment. Uh, I think it came in 1996. Uh, uh, setting out these uh, these sort of limits and patterns, including the Taj Trapezium Zone. Uh, so I think the uh, the difficulty we face is that uh, there are no uh, there's no single sort of point of contact or point of uh, uh, point of knowledge. So the knowledge that feeds into it comes from so many distinct quarters. I mean, from obviously from the side of uh, the ASI sector, who, as you pointed out, focus on built heritage. Uh, but also from the judiciary who uh, have no sort of great conception uh, of the way that local residents, uh, maybe one of them, relate to uh, relate to their own sort of monumental and built heritage. And this sort of clean separation um, is, uh, is, is a kind of ongoing thing. So the, to think back to, I mean, if I was to hear stories from just a generation ago when, as you said, people would go and play cricket in the gardens and picnic uh, at the Taj, etc. Uh, now it's just really difficult to fathom uh, because everything is so precisely marked out. It's not, uh, it's not a part of your lived reality anymore. And that's uh, very much so for the people who live next to the Taj Mahal, for whom it was also part of their mohalla. The mosque was, you know, uh, it still is used for prayer, but it's no longer... Uh, you know, the same way that it was 20 years uh, And so that very organic relationship with, uh, uh, with our monumental heritage is something that the state doesn't, doesn't respect. 
right absolutely and i think it becomes most apparent in a key space which is of the environment and i'm glad you brought mm-hmm. up the ttz the taj trophism zone and amit i'm going to ask you to just take us through some of those key aspects of it in my understanding uh um, so extreme and so i mean it is vitally important of course we need a zone of environmental regulation such that the the uh, so that the taj is protected against pollution but uh, um shutting down bakeries operating in tajganj may not solve that problem and what struck me and i'll come back to you for a moment is the case of the mathura refinery which was asked to shut down um what was concerning to me was and this is quite reflective of the issue at hand is that the problem with the mathura refinery was not that it was polluting the air of mathura residents but it was polluting the air of agra and the taj would be affected by it so clearly when we have a situation in which the people are being marginalized in uh in the context of the privileging of the of a built past when they were just going to have the development of antagonism um the 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 taj trophism case is really emblematic of that don't you think that um you here you have a zone of regulated commerce and regulated industry the coal refinery the iron foundries are shut down and the city no longer has a sustainable source of econ- of uh, income generation anymore So yeah just you know the Taj Trapezium for those who don't know about it is a 50 km no development zone around Agra designed because of the threat from pollutants from the Mathura refinery and I had been actually on one of the uh inspection tours of the Mathura refinery with the Ministry of Environment shortly after the Supreme Court judgment of 1996 and the refinery officials told us they maintain zero emissions and it was almost not financially viable for them to keep this refinery going at zero emission there were birds in their water treatment tanks so they were really performing very well but then you come back to agra and you're told there's no industrial development here for the next, for 50 kilometers one and a half million people in 1997 were directly out of work and perhaps 4 million plus indirectly they were told to go to ferozabad and here and there yeah there was no school no college no bus no education no hospital their livelihoods were done to gone and the uh, structural changes proposed by the supreme court which was alternate fuel provision um sewage sanitation drainage most of that is still observed in the breach you've put a highway through the edge of the wall of rambag sure the pollution has gone out of the supposedly out of the moat of agra fort but the jamuna river itself is turbid absolutely it's a national problem yeah. it's not the agra's problem they've absolutely. turned the sewage out of the river but until you stop putting 80% of delhi's waste into the jamuna mm. and please remember the jamuna flows past mathra where it is used for sacred rituals and that same water arrives in agra stagnant turbid and unusable so you have a city which no longer relates to the river they wash their trucks on the edge of the river there was a huge leather industry because you know everybody arrived at akbar's court to make shoes for his army and that continued through the years they wound up making books for the british during world war 1 and 2 and today they're gone yeah yeah same Absolutely. with metal workers they were making shields and swords 500 years ago 600 600 years ago and today you close them down and say go find livelihood in pezabad 550 kilometers away so it's a declining economy it's a declining population yeah. there's no effort uh, there isn't sufficient effort to bring the city back and i i firmly believe and i am convinced that one without the other cannot exist yeah. one no, is a no definitely um because i mean that not only is that the only way for a sustainable taj in the future but it is also going to be true to its own historic character that it is a product of agra uh had the taj been built in delhi it would not be the taj mahal the taj is exclusive it's highly local it's a highly localized form of 
architecture. And I can tell you, based on my time in Agra, uh, there are drains that flow past the Red Fort, there are drains that flow past the Taj Mahal through people's homes that empty out into the uh, Yamuna. The forest that you see before you at this moment of, um, is also, there's a key issue of whether, how do you balance forest management and the reclamation of farmland? Because a lot of the forest that go, that exists today has been built on reclaimed farmland. And what, you, what do the farmers do about it? So there are a lot of issues. And you're right, it's a pan-India multi-agency uh, problem, which needs to be sorted, uh, solved only through community engagement. But now I want to just touch upon one image before we move on. So this is an image from Amita's book, uh, which I highly recommend everyone get a copy of. And you can see the Yamuna flowing just near the Taj in the 1920s. And here's an image from 2019 of the same site. Um, so not only is the amount of pollution evident, um, we see a, so the Yamuna receding away from the monument. Um, so I think we might not be too, we might not have a lot of time, so I'm going to get through the next two things quite quickly. Um, Sipur mm -hmm. another issue of this uh, e environmental regulation, environmental governance has been an over-reliance on uh, tourism. And COVID has definitely shown that there is a great deal of ambiguity, there's a great deal of doubt and fear. Most people who are tour, gu tour guides rely on, uh, on maybe at most 300 to 400 rupees a day. So could you just talk us through some of uh, the issues that you see of the over-reliance of an economy and the conversion of the Taj into just a source of tourism and nothing more? Um, I think that's part and parcel of the greatest story of deindustrialization that uh, that you mentioned. Um, one of the reasons that there has been such an over-reliance on tourism is because employment avenues have shrunk uh, since the TTZ came up. And um, the other, of course, is that even the re reliance on tourism is very lopsided. It's re it relies very greatly on foreign tourists, mm -hmm. uh, just, just as a sort of off-the-cuff example. I mean, uh, the, the Taj attracts, for example, I don't know, two, three million, four million Indian tourists a year, uh, the temple at Tirupati attracts five times that number. So uh, the tourism economy is also very lopsided. It's, it's, it's very reliant on foreign tourism, which has been at a standstill for the, for the last one year. And of course, that affects uh, the economy as well, but it also affects the kind of intangible uh, heritage that is, uh, that is part and parcel of Agra's mobile legacy. And that's, you know, my Marble in Lake uh, um, and this, this sort of craftsmanship, these artisans who uh, uh, who really are a kind of they they are, they are descendants of, uh, or at least they think of themselves as descendants of mm -hmm. the same people who built the Taj Mahal, and they see themselves as inheritors uh, of uh, of of this legacy uh, of of Mughal craftsmanship, of Mughal artisanship. And for them, it's very, uh, very difficult as well, because uh, with the kind of slowdown that they're witnessing, a whole tradition, a whole kind of intangible cultural uh, heritage really is, is in danger of disappearing. And that's, again, another uh, uh, sort of consequence of this, uh, of this over-dependence, because they have the amount of wealth that is attracted to the city has been uh, has been on the wane so it, that its effect goes beyond just the economy or just the built heritage right absolutely and the talking about the wealth imbalance i mean a lot of people in agra would argue that it is people in Delhi who control the tourism market anyway. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean if you, I'm sure you, you're familiar with the fact that Agra doesn't have a, a, an airport, an international mm -hmm. airport, the one, I mean, um, the, the kind one would expect it to. So I think there's a wider issue at hand here and a lot of diverse political lobbying and uh, sort of entrenched issues. Now, this is a good segue to talk about the elephant or shall I say the goat in the picture. Um, the current climate in which the Taj is, we see receding from the importance that it has had in the Indian 
uh, cultural imaginaire. Um, we see attacks on it from uh, right-wing Hindu politicians. We see attacks from uh, in uh, local saffronized saffron organizations tend to have uh, have offered prayers at the Taj. Um, so I'll take this to the both of you and feel free to come in whenever. I mean, one. What is it about this particular moment in which places of national importance, monumental spaces, become subjects of vilification? And secondly, what is this? Um, why is it that people call the Taj Mahal a temple? So can I answer that first? Because I think one of the key reasons that we began to invest in writing this book and the trajectory the book took was Rahul Mehrathra and I standing at the west gate of the Taj. So this is just a copy of Amitabh's book, which I highly recommend everyone get a copy of. Watching these huge, enormous queues of people waiting to enter, and this is the western gate, and you know, independent mm. of India, we segregate our domestic travelers from the foreigners. They wait as much as three to four, and sometimes even five hours in the blazing heat to enter the Taj. And over the years, because we spent so much time there, you follow them and you see the reverence and the veneration with which they visit the tomb. Mm. That really is trans faith. The, the particular group we spoke to were pilgrims from Gwalia who'd been to Gangotri and were on their way back. They were, this was a reverence to the forefathers. Mm. It's a veneration of your Absolutely. forefathers. Yeah. It doesn't matter who it is. Mm -hmm. I think so. these were rural people. We were amazed that one, the strength and the inner um, soul with which faith, that defines our culture, with mm -hmm. which they wait five and six hours, they would drop five rupees. Now that's all been closed off, but they were dropping money at the crypt. Yep. That is our culture, Sartak. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Funny. Aurangzeb today is vilified. Please go to Bibi Ka Makbara. I have never seen someone <laughs> as is thrown on his uh, on Bibi Ka, on his wife's grave. Yeah, exactly. It is our culture to venerate. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, I have a particular. Uh, more, sorry, Tripura, do you want to just take us through the through the cultural uh, sort of the intellectual assault on the Taj? And I just want to say that we have about I guess. Um, about seven or eight minutes, if I'm not wrong. Um, so, and we'll take some questions at the end as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, just to quite quickly run through it. I mean, the Taj has, uh, in, in one sense, uh, this sort of ownership uh, uh, of uh, claim of ownership of the Taj Mahal, etc., uh, tells us a lot about its its kind of its life in the public imagination. So, in one mm. sense, it's always been contested. You know, at, you've had some long. Uh, long lost Mughal prince turn up to stake claim and file a case in the court. You've at some point had the Waqf board claim it as Waqf property. Yep. Uh, and uh, so in one sense, it's, it's, it's always been contested and that's, again, only establishes its importance in, in the mm. public imagination. But the uh, kind of current sort of assault, which, which stems from a, a repudiation of India's uh, Mughal past, uh, is is something new, and I think again it happens not just on the Taj. It's a, it's a kind of it's a part of a broader uh, broader tradition, and uh, somewhere it's interesting to think about, right? It that it always comes up in the context of a temple, uh, and it's something that I've figured out why uh, why would the Taj be a temple? Why was it not previously, for example, a pleasure palace or hmm. something something similar? Yep. No, mm. I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say something to do with the, the really the complex cosmological and geographical positioning because we are in Braj, we are in the land of Krishna mm. and Radha. So I think there's a really, really interesting sedimentation happening between different ways of approaching it. And Amita, I really liked what you said about veneration. I mean, I remember I was uh, across the river near Mehtab Bagh and I, I, in a place called Gyara City, which is the ruins of Humayu's observatory. And I saw this woman who'd come with her friend and they live outside Agra. And, and the, the, the friend just came up to Gyara City, bowed down and touched uh, her forehead with the stone. And I asked her, what are you doing? And she said, that's what we do. 
right? There was no idea on who built it, why it was built, whether it's an observatory, whether it's Hindu, whether it's Muslim, that is what we do. And there is something inherent in the material. There is an the aspect that it's been touched by Busurgs, touched by ancestors. It's a place of veneration, a way to take a beneficent. So we have a couple of questions. Um, Jessica asks, uh, do you think that the Taj Trapezium case happened quite late? Had it happened earlier, would there have been enough time to save the Taj Mahal? And uh, either of you? Um, I think it happened. Um, with the Mathra refinery, it was triggered mm. by the Mathra, the building of the Mathra refinery, which was in the late 80s. Um, 25 years on, I think the 500 meter green buffer zone has served the preservation of the monument extremely well. Uh, we didn't see it at the time. I feel infinitely disturbed that the other part, the structural reform part of the court judgment mm. has been implemented en passant. Mm. Right. Um, all right, so there's, this is quite a nice question. It's quite um, lighthearted, I guess. Um, so this is from JJ. He, uh, they asked that, uh, they were 15 when I first saw the Taj Mahal, and I remember my heart skipping a beat and my jaw dropping, uh, and that moment will stay with me forever. Uh, what was your Taj moment, and what do you hold there about the Taj? So, Trevor uh, Daman, you're an Agra local. You must have seen it a hundred times. I have, and uh, and it is it is a jaw dropping moment every time you go in because just the sheer scale and intricate work it kind of takes your breath away because you never quite appreciate uh, the scale of it, and that's true. But um, I I think uh, I've had so many moments it's hard to uh, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint. But there is one where uh, I went during a, a diplomatic visit, and I was quite young, and to be there almost alone or in like a very small party. Is uh, was a kind of experience in itself because you you truly get to just appreciate what the effect of it might have been a hundred years ago or right. somewhere where you know you had that sort of intimate access uh, to the monument. Perfect, uh, Amita. Oh, Sarthak, it blows me away every time. <laughs> it blows me away every time. I think you know one of the most beautiful moments was finding the sketch plan of the dome on the. Oh, of course. Khana, with writing next to it, and it had been, you know, there have never been found drawings of the mm. line found, but so to find the sketches where they're trying to work out the curvature of the dome, oh my god, yeah, blown away. I think that will stay with me as, yeah, we've touched a piece of history yeah. here. Uh, sorry? Touched a piece of the crew. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's what I feel every time I go in there as well. I have, I have too many. To, to, I don't, we don't have enough time for me to go on recounting mine. But I do, I, I do agree that spending time in there alone, uh, you know, just as the sun is setting and we're standing in front of the mosque, and you see how every moment the color changes. And you see birds moving around, swifts coming up from the river. So it's a very um, ethereal quality, uh, which I, uh, which I, it always, I always think about that when I try and write about it, when I try to think about it. Um, so there's one more question from Ria. Uh, she asks, uh, the Taj Mahal is an important place in our cultural history. Is there any other monument in the Indian subcontinent that you hold, that you think holds the same relevance? Is that me or triple? Uh, I mean, either of you. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I. Yeah. What do you guys think? India has stupendous heritage. Mm. Um, this is stupendous to me, and it's really a very personal, subjective thing. I mean, to me, this is what the man of for the most mm. part, the most spectacular. But if I went to Tanjavur, I would probably I say the same thing. Yeah. So um, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just just butting in. True, I think I think uh, like Amita, there's uh, <laughs> it's 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 hard to sort of pick one in that sense. But I I, I also think that this uh, sort of image that the, that has been cultivated of the Taj is being the sort of again as I mentioned the prize piece of India's uh, built heritage and kind of somehow embodying 
a particular notion of the country's civilization is one of the reasons why it, uh, why so much politics also uh, also focuses on it. And uh, I think it's it's kind of now got to a point where it's you know it's already established in the in the sort of cultural imagination. Mm. And the less we try to uh, you know the less politically charged it's kind of position in our imagination gets, the better I think it is for the monument and for those of us who have to live with it and engage with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one of the problems and one of the consequences of that is also the eclipsing of other spaces within the city, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the images that we showed are of monuments and places that I don't think people would know about. And the city has a very rich history, the city has a very rich culture that does tends to get eclipsed. I mean, um, there's an ethic in Agra recently you know, beyond the Taj Mahal. I know that is a, that's not a sort of a rejection of its cultural value, but that's a, a way to connect the city to its citizens, a way to go beyond the tropes that have been uh, caught that the Taj has become caught up in. Um, so I guess we have a couple of minutes and um, perhaps we'd like to end on our thoughts about what would it look like uh, a Taj which is very much integrated uh, with Agra. What would that look like? Amita, uh, your thoughts. Um, I think what you need to do, and I think one of the reasons we worked at Itmadadala is you need a much greater visitor dispersal, as it was saying, mm. so we have fabulous heritage. If you are able to create that dispersal, you will get people staying longer you would be able to get a local economic engine going. You know, Jaipur works for its heritage. The city lives for its heritage. To me, that's a brilliant example. It's creative, mm. cultural, it's monumental. Yeah. I think we need to work very hard to build that in Agra. It has, it's a sort of beta and Taj story at the moment. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but they have absolutely brilliant havelis inside. There's brilliant monuments. Yeah, we all, and I, I mean, I've fought the battle for many years, and now I know you in <laughs> Triple Daman are going to it so It has to be able to connect contemporarily and with its history. If you can't yeah. make the city contemporary, the history, the monument will not survive. Absolutely. Uh, Triple Daman. Just really quickly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important not to, not to kind of uh, take a static view on things. So these are, in, in some sense, of course, they're static buildings, but they're, they're, you know, they're part of a kind of moving uh, human, broad sweep of human history as well. And like Amita said, it's, it's important that funds, attention, uh, economic activity, et cetera, everything is dispersed. And she was uh, you know, instrumental in having the uh, Itmata Dola oh, Gardens uh, right. brought back to life. Yep. And I remember you and I went uh, went to see them once. Uh, mm, and in, it, it was the monsoon and there was a bit of a drizzle and the river was in spate, right, you know, uh, almost right up to the boundary, and it's a beautiful site. And there was hardly anyone there, mm. uh, and that's uh, and that's I think something that we need to work at because this is also part of uh, the city's legacy. And the Taj is very much connected with these monuments, both its sort of historical story and its sort of contemporary embedding. Right. I'm and gonna have to. Sorry, I'm so sorry, but I think what. I think I've just been told that we're, uh, we've, been, we've sort of taken up all our time and I apologize for cutting you off, but let's wholly put that image in our minds. Thank you so much to the both of you. That was a fascinating discussion. And I hope we can continue having these discussions, push the conversation forward, take us beyond the Taj to a Taj, which is very much an Agra monument. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you very much to JLF for organizing the session as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amita Beg, Tripur Daman Singh, and Sartak Malhotra for this insightful session. Thank you so much for being part of Jaipur Literature Festival 2021. We'd also like to thank our radio partner, MyFM, for supporting this session and our celebration partner, Diageo. And thank you all for watching and being such a lovely audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. As you're aware, the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic and while we have braced ourselves to embrace the new normal, we have struggled to ensure that we can continue to bring you a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We would love for you to support us at Team Bacards. Any contribution is welcome and would help spread knowledge and ideas seamlessly against all odds. You can also tweet using hashtag Festival 2021 at the rate Jepur Litfest. 
the festival is protected by Dettol. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.